Hello folks, welcome to our first recorded lecture for ML 103 Digital Valhalla's. So you're going to have at least two of these each week. Uh, we have three this first week because we don't have a tutorial. Uh, this one will be a little shorter. Um, it's mostly just introducing some of the theoretical ideas that we're working with in medievalism studies to you. Um, we'll have a second uh, lecture in that set that looks at some of the more complex ideas and then uh, also this week a lecture on history and fantasy with regards to the Vikings. My best suggestion for how to listen to these is to do them uh, with the slideshow open beside you. See if you can't use the slideshow as a way of helping to take notes. They are meant to be outlines basically. They aren't summaries of the lectures by any way any uh, stretch of the imagination. Uh, trust me, if you, if you rely on just the PowerPoints, you'll be missing the vast bulk of the material. Uh, I've put them on YouTube because YouTube will caption them and they should do a reasonable job of captioning them. If anybody has difficulties with that, however, and needs the captions, just let me know and we'll see what we can work out. Um, you can always listen to them a little bit speeded up as well. I'm not sure I'd recommend that. I don't talk particularly slowly, but that is up to you. All right, so why am I talking to you about theory? Well, we need to understand how to approach uh, texts like these games. And I call them texts, even though they are games, because it's a, a sort of a catch-all term. Uh, we are looking at it from the perspective of medievalism studies. And as I mentioned in our first Zoom session, Med medieval studies and medievalism studies are not the same thing. Medieval studies looks at the actual Middle Ages. Medievalism studies looks at how we use medieval material, medieval ideas, aspects of medieval culture, and repurpose them in the modern day. Uh, service to service entertainment, uh, to make a point about our own modern world. There are a huge range of reasons why we keep going back to the medieval again and again. So the theory is a way of providing you with some vocabulary, some tools that you can use while looking at it. I'm going to provide you with a little bit more than you actually need, and I will be specific about what I think are the most valuable of these tools. So you will want to make sure that you make note of that in your notes. All right, so before we do anything else, Let's just have a basic definition. So this is from a book called Medievalism's Making the Past and the Present. It is not the only definition of medievalism by any stretch of the imagination, again, but it is one that's pretty useful because it has a few different layers. So as you see, medievalism is the art, literature, scholarship, scholarship avocational pastimes, and sundry forms of entertainment and culture that turn to the Middle Ages for their subject matter or inspiration, and in doing so, explicitly or implicitly, by comparison or contrast, comment on the artist's contemporary sociocultural status. Now, as I said, layers. So this definition acknowledges that these different texts and methods and formats are all using the medievalist inspiration. But they're using it for a reason. They're using it so that the author can create some type of comparison, some type of contrast with their own world, with their own concerns. So if I was going to shorten that, I would borrow a quote from another author and say we use the medieval to comment on the modern. That kind of uh, contains the whole thing there and if look fewer words but I like this definition because it's very specific so remember the layers here it's not just the what of how of what exactly is being used but it's the why and what why is the what being changed or reimagined in the way that it is now, some of you may have heard the name Umberto Eco before. He was extremely famous. He was a scholar, I was a medieval literary specialist, but also a semiotician. And probably where any of you who've heard of him would have heard of him, he also very was a very famous novelist. Um, 
he wrote some tremendously influential works. Uh, probably the most famous is called The Name of the Rose. It's about um, uh, a sort of murder mystery at a medieval monastery. Now, Echo was a really interesting thinker, and he looked into the Middle Ages and understood that we take the medieval out of the Middle Ages and we bring it with us into the modern day. And we do it in a number of different ways. And he pointed out back in the 80s, so back when medievalism studies was just like a gleam in a few people's eyes, this is a, a really new discipline, like I said back at the Zoom session. Uh, he understood that you can't really talk about it unless you look at all the different Middle Ages that people imagine. So he came up with a list of 10. And we're going to run through it really quickly. It's, it's not so useful anymore. In fact, it was really not particularly useful to start with. The reason for that is because it was kind of tongue-in-cheek. And some of the categories overlapped. You will see when I lay them out for you that that was the case. But it was a beginning. It was an attempt to start categorizing how we use the medieval. So it's important to acknowledge that it's there and that some of the ideas are still useful. So Umberto Eco's Ten Little Middle Ages. You have the Middle Ages as pretext. If I had to sum this up, it's the Middle Ages being used to enjoy modern characters. Uh, he talks about the Middle Ages being a mythological stage in this case. Now, if anybody has seen the movie A Knight's Tale with Heath Ledger, you know, that is a sports movie. It's a modern sports movie where you have the plucky underdog comes from nowhere, becomes the champion, gets the girl, embarrasses his mortal enemy, his rival. It's the typical sports movie story. It's just that, you know, it's the uh, 14th century and they're jousting. So that's a perfect example of the Middle Ages as pretext. So that is actually one category that's still pretty useful because we do see a lot of that. Uh, he also talks about the Middle Ages as a site of ironic revisitation. So this is a bit complicated. What he means by this is, you know, this refers to texts or works that look at the Middle Ages as a sort of heroic younger age, you know, where men were men and women were grateful and everything was done in the most heroic and uh, impressive way possible. And yet, we also look back on that and know that's just an illusion, hence the irony of it all. Now, another one that's still useful is the idea of the Middle Ages as a barbaric age, and Echo coins this great term shaggy medievalism. Because the, the movies, for instance, that would fall into this category, all of the men have copious facial hair, usually lengthy actual hair, too. Um, this is not all about violence. There is the concept of the noble savage, the primal barbarian figure who is more honorable than the civilized southern figure. That's something we'll talk about when we talk about northern medievalism, because that's especially important for us. This idea of the noble savage is something that shapes popular perceptions of the Vikings for a very long time. And a lot of this can be traced back to a work uh, by Tacitus called the Germania. And Tacitus was a Roman writer who supposedly wrote this ethnography about the Germanic tribes, where he talked about, you know, how impressive they were as warriors, how their customs were admirable in so many ways. Even though they were primitive, they understood how to behave better than Romans did. Tacitus is not writing about the Germanic people when he does this. He's writing about what's wrong with the Roman people. And yet, later thinkers, especially mid-20th century thinkers after Tacitus is rediscovered, uh, would think this was wonderful. And unfortunately, ideas that were expressed in Tacitus were taken by people who eventually contributed to the rise of Nazi ideology. So it's a very dangerous set of ideas in a lot of ways. Now, he also talks about the Middle Ages of Romanticism. Please note the capital R. So I'm talking about the Romantic movement here, not romances and love, although oftentimes Romanticism does include love. Uh, romanticism as a movement is about, you know, emotion, about nature, about the individual, about adventure. Uh, it idolizes the medieval basically. And he's very vague about this. He talks about uh, the Middle Ages of Romanticism with its stormy castles and its ghosts. And this can overlap with the Middle Ages as a barbaric age and can overlap with the Middle Ages as pretext as well. 
All right, we're not going to talk about the Middle Ages of the Philosopha Perennis because uh, it's really complicated and it's not particularly applicable to our purposes. I just wanted to let you know all ten. Ah, I didn't turn the animation off. Oh, well. So the Middle Ages of National Identities. This is a little bit relevant to us. So the idea here is that a lot of European nations look back to the Middle Ages for the origins of their modern nation state, their culture, and certainly um, the role of the Vikings in European culture uh, is treated like that sometimes. Uh, decadentism is sort of medievalism and visual art. It's not really important for us. All right, philological reconstruction. So what this is referring to is scholarly medieval studies. So this is the historical novel that's 800 pages long and has a 50-page uh, epilogue that is all about his, the writer telling you what little bits and pieces of history they changed. So it's an attempt to be realistic, an attempt to be accurate. This is an interesting one of so-called tradition. So this is basically the esoteric Middle Ages, the Middle Ages of mysterious groups and buried treasure and ancient secrets being passed from group to group. And yeah, let's just come out and say the Templars represent this. So this is highly relevant for when we're talking about Assassin's Creed. You know, secret societies operating for centuries, yada, yada, yada. And finally, the Middle Ages of the expectation of the millennium. So the Middle Ages as a pre-apocalyptic society, a society on the edge of destruction. Now, the Middle Ages are sometimes also depicted as a post-apocalyptic society. So there's, I don't want to say that this category isn't useful, it's just that it's actually a little bit more complex than Echo realized. So that is Echo, and again, I gave you Echo so you could see where all of this theoretical stuff started, because everything that comes after builds on echo and thankfully it simplifies things big time you know it's this is unwieldy so many of these categories overlap like i said others are just not clear at all he was trying to be funny in some of them so it's not really a good tool even though some of the ideas are worth keeping so where we see new approaches happen uh first of all is in a book by david matthews called Medievalism, a Critical History. And this was published in 2015. And I just have to stress again, this is not uncommon. I mean, there are still people today, today, writing articles about the terminology we should use when we talk about medievalism. I've done a little bit of that myself. The reason is we are still settling how we want to talk about this as scholars. It is such a new discipline that we're still having those initial debates. And so the fact that this tremendously influential contribution to those debates only comes along in 2015 tells you that. So Matthews is writing mostly about 19th century medievalism, but he comes up with two particular aspects of medievalism, sort of a dichotomy. It's first of all, Gothic or grotesque medievalism. And he defines this as where the medieval involves, quote, threat, violence, and warped sexuality, where the threat of sexual violence is made, something medieval is going on. Uh, three words for you, Game of Thrones. Right? Yep. You know, there's a, we look at the Middle Ages as, as a place where bad things happened. The other part of that dichotomy is romantic medievalism. And so this is like Echo. A little bit more complex. We're going to go delve deeper into these on the next two slides. But the interesting thing is what Matthew says is that these two types of medievalism don't exclude each other. You can have Gothic and Romantic medievalism within the same text, basically. He also introduces the idea that medievalism is residual, that it is not a dominant cultural threat. Now, it's interesting. When I first started looking into medievalism, which was several years before he published his book, um, I jokingly suggested a concept I called stealth medievalism, 
where you would see bits and pieces of the medieval sort of peeking through works that didn't appear to be medieval. And uh, this is not quite what he means by residual, uh, but it is similar to what he means by residual medievalism. And now I think the important thing about that is to recognize that he's writing this in 2013, 2014. He's writing this pre-Game of Thrones. And Game of Thrones had a tremendous impact on popular culture. I mean, as much as nobody wants to talk about Game of Thrones anymore, it certainly set off a massive wave of medieval material. So I genuinely do not think we can say medievalism is residual anymore. I think we can say, and say fairly securely, that it actually is a major thread within popular culture. You're free to disagree with that, but my argument is that we do see a great change following the success of Game of Thrones. All right, delving into grotesque medievalism a little bit more. So he defines this as the, the other, the rejected past, the grotesque forebear of modernity. And he lumps into this uh, negative uses of the word medieval. So when Donald Trump gets up and starts ranting about ISIS and says, oh, they're so medieval, that's Trump tapping into grotesque medievalism. And yet there is a sort of thrill to grotesque medievalism. Think about vampire narratives. You know, yeah, it's a little bit dicey in terms of consent in a lot of cases. Um, you know, it's, it's, there are problems with vampire narratives and similar things, but people are still drawn to them. So people are drawn to grotesque medievalism. Matthews suggests that this is actually the dominant form of medievalism. And I would tentatively agree with him for the simple fact that, frankly, people who are not well-educated in medievalism and the Middle Ages still talk freely about the Dark Ages. So the idea that the Middle Ages were someplace dark, someplace you didn't want to be, is still very prevalent in historical thinking. It's, again, it's wrong. It's very, very wrong, but it is what it is. All right, so in contrast, Romantic medievalism, he defines it at much greater length than Echo does. So it is sort of based around the idea that something valuable was lost with the Middle Ages, that there was something good about the medieval world that we don't have anymore. And the way he defines this is, you know, these are the Middle Ages of romance, of chivalric deeds, but also simple communitarian living and humanely organized labor. No factories, no assembly lines. If you're going to work with your family at their workplace, it was off in your cottage, right? Now, it is a fundamentally romantic look at the medieval economy. The medieval economy did not do very well for a lot of people that took part in it, obviously. But it is a little bit of nostalgia for the pre-industrial world. It's very conservative, basically. Now, the problem, the reason why romantic medievalism takes a hit in the early 20th century is specifically World War I. Because you cannot be romantic in the trenches. It's just not really possible. Now, this doesn't mean romantic medievalism dies. It certainly goes on. It changes shape, however. And so you see things like symbolic medievalism. So the idea of romantic medievalism, the grail, the wasteland, shows up in T.S. Eliot's poems. So the same impulse is there. It's just under very tight control. It's shaped in a way that uh, you know, prevents it uh, from being seen quite as clearly. I don't know if anybody's ever tried to read T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. But yeah, it's, uh, it's tough. If you know what you're looking for, you can pick the medievalism out of it, but only if you know what you're looking for. Now, neo-medievalism, which is something we're going to talk about in the next lecture, also has a romantic form. And this is what we see in something like Tolkien. So Tolkien's depiction of the Shire is the best example of this. So this is the idea that the Romantic is the pre-industrial. The medieval is the pre-industrial, rather, in the Romantic view of the medieval. All right, so that's his dichotomy. And I'm going to remind you what I said. It's important to recall that he acknowledges these two different types of medievalism can actually operate within the same text. They're not mutually exclusive. 
Now there's one other set of ideas that he uses that is tremendously important for our purposes. And I'd like to call this his three little middle ages. He doesn't call it that. Um, in fact, uh, I once had a student contact him and say, oh, I really like your categorization system for medievalism. And he went, my what? And I was like, really? It's, it's kind of right there in your textbook. But uh, I don't know. She may have phrased it in a way that he didn't quite understand. Now, he does talk about three middle ages, and it's a way of sort of riffing off Echo. So first of all, it's the middle ages as it was. So this is where the medieval is depicted realistically, or what is thought to be realistic, at least. So historical novels, historical films, or documentaries, perhaps, rather. The Middle Ages as it might have been. Now, Echo, no, not Echo, sorry, Matthews, describes this as the medievalist legend. You know, the medieval that, uh, that you see in stories of King Arthur and Robin Hood and that sort of thing. And finally, the Middle Ages as it never was. So this is what refers to things like fantasy works, to things like uh, star kingdoms in outer space. He defines this as quasi, pre, parallel, or non-Middle Ages using medieval motifs which create a medieval appearance. Now, I find these very useful. Uh, certainly, um, for us, number two and number three are probably most significant because none of the games that we're looking at in this class are actually trying to be accurate to the Middle Ages. Probably the closest that is almost doing that is Assassin's Creed Valhalla. But even for them, perfect accuracy is not what they're shooting for. They need to be able to tell their story. So I know that was a little bit heavy, but I'm hoping that by breaking these up into smaller chunks, you're not overwhelmed by any of it. You know, what I would focus on here is making sure that you understood the difference between romantic and grotesque medievalism, and then the difference between the three different types of Middle Ages at that last category. And that should be all you really need to take forward with you. All right, so that is the end of our first lecture, and I will be back before too long with a second.